Let us pray. Holy God, we pray that you would speak your words to us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations on all of our hearts be acceptable unto you. For you, O Lord, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It has been said that music is a universal language. It is something all of us have in common, no matter where we're from or what we're, we do. It's something that is universally loved, even if we love a different type of music than our neighbor or our children do. I have always loved music. Some of my earliest memories are of my dad playing the guitar when he was home on leave from his submarine. He would sing songs like Grandma's Feather Bed and I Am the Eagle by John Denver and Leave It on a Jet Plane and Country Roads, which we changed to talk about Arizona instead of West Virginia because that's where my parents were. My parents uh, sang in the choir, my dad played the trumpet, and as soon as we could, my siblings and I joined in. People um, joke that families uh, with lots of children have enough for like a baseball team or a basketball team, but that's not true in my family. I think my parents were trying to have enough for, for a band. They wanted a full orchestra. We weren't the Partridge family, but we had lots of instruments. Between all of my siblings, we played the flute, the clarinet, the saxophone, the bass clarinet, the viola, the cello, the violin, the piano, the guitar, the bass guitar, the ukulele, the mandolin, and percussion. And hopefully I got all of them because one of my sisters is here to tell me if I missed one. If you look at my musical selection on my phone or iPod, you will see that I have a very eclectic selection. There's everything from organ music to rap music, folk tunes, contemporary Christian rock, country, opera, Broadway. I've got it all. Last year, I made myself a playlist called For My Soul that has all of the pieces in my iPod that speak directly to my heart. Pieces of music that can calm me when I'm angry, that help me to pray when I'm feeling like I need it, pieces that help me get out my anger because I can sing them at the top of my lungs when nobody else is around to hear me, pieces that make me cry, and pieces that give me goosebumps. Can you think of a piece of music that makes you emotional every time you hear it? Or maybe one that gives you chills? There was a study published in so, uh, Social Psychology and Personality Science that tells us that that's actually a physical phenomenon, that certain songs can trigger, trigger activity in the hypothalamus of a person's brain. That's the part in our brain responsible for hunger and rage and involuntary responses like blushing and goosebumps. The really interesting part is that the researchers discovered that the style or genre of music did not determine those responses. They said what's most important is a person's openness to experience. In other words, one's willingness to be moved by the music or any other type of experience. Isn't that fascinating? If we're open to an experience, it physically affects our brains. We are in the third week of Advent. It's hard to believe it, but that means that Christmas is now only two weeks away, so people like me who've not done any Christmas shopping better get started, because we really have less than that. It's two weeks of navigating the already and the not yet, of finding ourselves struggling to live into the story of Advent in a world that's already jumped to Christmas and in some, some stores, Valentine's Day. Each week we've been navigating the stories of Jesus' birth in each of the four Gospels. We began with the Gospel of Mark, learning that indeed he doesn't even mention Jesus' birth, but skips right to his cousin John the Baptist and his ministry. We learned that John the Baptist's call for us to prepare the way of the Lord and to make his path straight can help us find joy as we intentionally slow down. And then last week, we read in Matthew and learned about Joseph and how we can find joy living in the present and into the call that God has for each of us. So this week, we turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke is almost always the version of the Christmas story that we hear on Christmas Eve. And if we're truthful, I think we would have to name that the Gospel of Luke is a favorite at Christmas time, mostly because it's what we remember hearing in the Peanuts Christmas movie. Hearing little Linus recite it is the most poignant part of that whole movie, right? This week I read a description of the differences between the three Gospels that I love. It said this, Mark wrote with urgency and a sparse narrative style. Matthew wrote with an ominous tone. John, we will discover next week, wrote with a poetic flourish. But Luke wrote with a song in his head. If you pay attention to Luke's telling of the Christmas story, you'll notice that nearly every major character breaks into song at some point. His nativity set would be a singing musical one, like a Broadway number. 
The, author, the same author went on to say, and I think this is a great way to remember the differences in the Gospels if you ever feel the need to know that. Mark is like Reader's Digest. Matthew is like a Stephen King novel. John is like a Shakespeare play. And Luke is like a Broadway musical. It's a great description of the four Gospels. So let's consider each of these pieces, the songs in the Gospel of Luke, and what we might learn from them as we seek joy in the midst of this Advent season. We're going to begin with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Luke tells us that Zechariah was an elderly priest living during the time of King Herod, whom we talked a little bit about last week. Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were old and childless. Luke tells us, despite their most earnest prayers... One fateful day while Zechariah is in the temple performing his priestly work, the angel Gabriel comes to him and says, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now considering Zechariah and Elizabeth's long desire to have children, you might think that his response would have been, thank you, or alleluia, or amen. Instead, he responds with almost a challenge to the angel, much like his ancestor Sarah does. He says, how can I be sure of this? My wife and I are really old. Or in my translation, you've got to be kidding me. Now really, I think we can understand Zachariah's response. It's similar to the ones some of us have had during this and every Advent season. As we pray for peace, some of us think, peace on earth, you've got to be kidding, that's never going to happen. Or season of hope, I can barely keep my life together. Joy and gladness, for me, that is impossible. For many of us, in the midst of all of this chaos and frustration, when the good news of Jesus comes into our midst, we can hardly believe it. It seems too extraordinary, too far-fetched. So our response becomes much like Zachariah's, you've got to be kidding me. The angel responds to Zachariah with a message of strength, telling him, that because he doesn't believe, he will become struck silent until the message that he's proclaimed has come to pass. Now, I can tell you from experience that losing your voice as a priest is the worst nightmare, right? Most of us, when we become clergy, start having one of two nightmares every night for the first year. One, that we're late for or have entirely missed a worship service. I can't tell you how many times I've woken up at 2 a.m. certain that I'd missed church my first year of ministry. And two, laryngitis on the morning that we're supposed to preach, right? Those are like the two worst nightmares you can have. So this must have been awful for Zachariah. But I think it also must have been, in a way, a blessing, can you imagine the chaos that must have surrounded the announcement of Elizabeth's pregnancy? The people clamoring with questions and disbelief and opinions about what has happened. I think the silence gave him time to concentrate not on what his response would be to all of them, but on his own faith. Maybe it gave him time to put into perspective what was to happen, to prepare himself for being a parent whose job it would be to raise the one who would go before the Messiah. And I have to think that John the Baptist must have been what we call now a strong-willed child. Zachariah would need strength for the journey. So finally the baby is born, and it comes time to name him. People assume he should be called Zachariah, but Elizabeth says, no, his name will be John. And so they turn to Zachariah because what Elizabeth said wasn't good enough. And he writes on his tablet, his name is John. And at that moment, he can speak again. And his first words are ones of praise to God. It is a song of gratitude for the gift of his son, one acknowledging the impact he is going to have on the world and a prayer of blessing for him. He says, and you, my child, will be called a prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the path of peace. I think Zechariah learned these lessons, came up with these words during his time of silence, because silence is a great teacher. 
Any music leader will tell you that silence in music is just as important, sometimes more so, than any note that is played or sung. Think about your own time during this season. Are there ways you could intentionally incorporate some silence into your day? Offering a chance for the Holy Spirit to calm your soul or God a chance to work on something on your spiritual to-do list? In the midst of overwhelming noise, even when some of it's good noise, silence can be our most important teacher. The next song in Luke's gospel comes from Mary and is probably the most famous of the three songs in Luke. Luke doesn't tell us a whole lot about Mary. Really, none of the gospels do. We know that she is a young girl, that she's engaged to Joseph, and then we find out she is a relative of Elizabeth's, which is an indication to us, the reader, that her song and Zachariah's song are linked. Hopefully, you've noticed that Mary has almost the same response Zachariah did to the angel's pronouncement, both in the form of questions. Zachariah asks, how can I be sure my wife and I are very old? And Mary asks, how will this happen since I haven't lain with a man? Now, maybe it was the tone of her voice was a little different than Zachariah's, or maybe it was because Mary was young and Zachariah was an old priest who should have known better than to question a messenger of God. But for whatever reason, Mary's question isn't met with a consequence, but with an answer. uh, The angel gives an an explanation that is really more theological than biological, telling her that the Holy Spirit will come over her and the power of the Most High will overshadow her. And then he offers her proof that what he says is true, something she can check out for herself, telling her about Elizabeth's pregnancy. And he ends with the words, nothing is impossible for God. And it's with those words that Mary's questions turn into a statement of faith. I am the Lord's servant, let it be with me just as you have said. There's something beautiful about the fact that it is the knowledge of Elizabeth's pregnancy that gives Mary the courage to say yes to God. And here's what I think we can learn from that. Whenever something miraculous happens in scripture, every time, it is never for the benefit of the recipient alone. When someone in scripture is blessed in any way with healing, with answered prayer, with a miraculous birth, it is so that the recipient can become a blessing for others. We see it over and over and over again. Now, we don't know much about Elizabeth, but we do know that she became an incredible source of encouragement for Mary before she even knew of Mary's pregnancy. Luke gives us more evidence of this when Mary and Elizabeth meet. He tells us that Mary rushes right there, a journey that would have taken her on foot eight to ten days in the first trimester of her pregnancy. She and Elizabeth meet, and Elizabeth feels the baby son move within her. She offers Mary incredible words of encouragement, saying to her, God has blessed you above all women, and he has blessed the child you carry. Happy is she who believed that the Lord would fulfill the promises he made to her. It's amazing the way that Luke lays this out for us, because he is telling us that just as John the Baptist acts as a forerunner for Jesus, so Elizabeth is a forerunner for Mary. She shows her that when one is blessed by God, one must become a blessing for others. Elizabeth is a blessing for Mary so that Mary could become a blessing for the whole world. And it's then, after her encounter with Elizabeth, that Mary sings, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of this servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arms. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Perhaps you've noticed in Mary's song a shift that occurs after the first three verses. The beginning, the first three verses, are about what God has done for Mary. And then after verse three, it shifts to what God will do through Mary. Mary's song is vitally important to the season of Advent, a season of waiting for a Jesus who is already here, already in our midst. And I think we are given three choices when we are called by God like Mary was, when we are blessed by God. One, we can say no to God's call. That's always an option. It's called free will. 
Two, we can say yes, but then keep that blessing to ourselves. Or three, we can be like Elizabeth and Mary, using God's blessings to us to bless the world. We can do something as simple as Elizabeth does, encouraging those around us. We can share our stories to let others know that they are not alone. Finally, friends, we come to the song of the angels. We didn't hear it this morning, but the angel's message to the shepherds begins with the same words that they gave to Zechariah and Mary. Do not be afraid. They are words of comfort in the midst of their fear. I mean, can you imagine? Really, all of our nativity characters had reasons to fear. Mary faced real consequences as a young woman pregnant out of wedlock. The shepherds' whole job, their whole entire job, is caring for their flock, and that meant looking out for the very next threat. They had to always be afraid of what was going to become next and ready to face it. And all of our characters, from Zechariah to Joseph, faced the oppressive reign of the Roman government, which meant lots of fear. It meant heavy taxation and forced census and violence at every turn. And as Israelites, they have faced this fear before under the Babylonians and the Persians and the Greeks and the Seleucids and now the Romans. The years had passed under different forms of oppression, longing for a Messiah, waiting for freedom and liberation that could come only from God. And it's into that atmosphere that the angels come to the shepherds in that field, singing glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. I wonder if at first their response to the angels was the same as Zachariah's or ours when we hear hope for peace in the midst of our world. You've got to be kidding. But still, the angels sang, a song of hope for a people who must have felt hopeless. There's a story <clears throat> told of a man named Vedran uh, Smelovic. It's a Bosnian name, and I've probably just butchered it. I was going to call Amira to ask her to pronounce it for me, and I forgot to do it. So Vedran lived in Sarajevo, uh, the capital of Bosnia, during the Bosnian War. Sarajevo underwent the longest siege of a capital city in modern warfare. It lasted from 1992 to 1996, during which time nearly 14,000 people were killed and over 100,000 houses and buildings were damaged or destroyed. One of the attacks that happened killed 22 people while they waited in line at a bakery to buy bread. Afterwards, Vedran played an important role. He wasn't a doctor or a politician or a soldier. He was a musician, an accomplished cellist with the Sarajevo Philharmonic Orchestra. So when he could do nothing to stop the war, nothing to calm the violence, nothing to save his friends and family, Vedran did what he knew how to do. He played. He would take his cello and play in ruined buildings around the city. One of the pieces he played was Adagio in G minor. We'll link it to our Facebook page later so you can hear it. It's a beautiful piece. He played at funerals during the war, war even though they were often targeted by snipers. He played out in public for 22 days, one for every person killed at the bakery. There was actually a book written that used his name, but it was a fictionalized account in case you've ever, it was called The um, Cellist of Sarajevo. He, but he's a real-life person, and his music brought comfort to the grieving, a salve to the wounded at heart, to a war-weary country and people. He, in effect, provided a real-time soundtrack to accompany the agonies of the suffering, expressing in the only way he knew how the pain that his people were experiencing. But even more than that, his public performances were an act of bold confrontation to the powers at large, a proclamation that no act of violence, no evil deed, could thwart the spirit of a people determined to live in freedom. He was in some ways providing real hope, hope that even in the midst of death and war and pain, life and music could play on. Friends, I think this is our task as a church, to sing the songs of God. Our job in the midst of a war-torn world, in the midst of a weary time filled with fear and hatred, is not to fight or cower, but to sing. We are to claim the songs of peace and comfort and courage, boldly performing them in the public spaces that are filled with pain, places where the world needs to hear them the most. An author I read this week says, we must sing a song whose lyrics speak of self-giving love rather than self-addicted agendas, a song whose sounds are counterwaves to the thrum of war chants and the clanging of swords, a song whose melody drives us upward towards holiness and purity rather than into the darkest recesses of our sinful instincts, a sacred harmony that pulses with God's unconditional love, calling us to forgiveness. 
Friends, we are to sing them, not in the shadows or in the security of our sanctuaries alone, but directly in the face of those who seek to oppress. We, the church, are to be a living, lyrical witness to the power of the resurrection. We are to share hope that life and music play on, even in the midst of death, when lived in Christ. This is our call on the third week of Advent, to live into the silence of Zechariah, to be a blessing to the world like Mary and Elizabeth, and to sing songs of hope like the angels. We have a song to perform. Each of us have a piece to play in God's orchestra, and so we must begin. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.